The Wars of the Jews by Josephus. Book 1, chapters 25 and 26. Chapter 25. Archelaus procures a reconciliation between Alexander, Pheroras, and Herod. Now, as to Alexander, since he perceived it impossible to persuade his father that he was innocent, he resolved to meet his calamities, however severe soever they were. So he composed four books against his enemies, and confessed that he had been in a plot but declared withal that the greatest part of the courtiers were in a plot with him, and chiefly Pheroras and Salome, nay, that Salome once came and forced him to lie with her in the night-time, whether he would or no. These books were put into Herod's hands, and made a great clamor against the men in power. And now it was that Archelaus came hastily, came hastily into Judea, being affrighted for his son-in-law and his daughter, and he came as a proper assistant, and in a very prudent manner, and by a stratagem he obliged the king not to execute what he had threatened. For when he was come to him, he cried out, Where in the world is this wretched son-in-law of mine? Where shall I see the head of him which contrived to murder his father, which I will tear to pieces with my own hands? I will do the same also to my daughter, who hath such a fine husband. For although she be not a partner in the plot, Yet, by being the wife of such a creature, she is polluted. And I cannot but admire at thy patience, against whom this plot is laid, if Alexander be still alive, for as I come with what haste I could from Cappadocia, I expected to find him put to death for his crimes long ago. But still, in order to make an examination of thee about my daughter, whom, out of regard and by dignity, I had espoused to him in marriage, but now we must take counsel about them both. And if thy paternal affection be so great that thou canst punish thy son, who hath plotted against thee, let us change our right hands, and let us succeed to the other in expressing our rage upon this occasion. When he had made this pompous declaration, he got Herod to remit of his anger, though he were in disorder, who thereupon gave him the books which Alexander had composed to be read by him, and as he came to every head, he considered of it, together with Herod. So Archelaus took hence the occasion for that stratagem which he made use of, and by degrees he laid the blame on those men whose names were in those books, and especially upon Pheroras. And when he saw that the king believed him, to be in earnest, he said, We must consider whether the young man be not himself plotted, young man be not himself plotted against by such a number of wicked wretches, and not thou plotted against by the young man. For I cannot see any occasion for his falling into so horrid a crime, since he enjoys the advantages of royalty already, and has the expectation of being one of thy successors. I mean this, unless there were some persons that persuade him to it, and such persons as make an ill use of the faculty, they know there is to persuade young men, for by such persons not only young men are sometimes imposed upon, but old men also, and by them sometimes are the most illustrious families and kingdoms overturned. Herod assented to what he had said, and by degrees abated of his anger against Alexander, but was more angry at Pheroras, for the principal subject of the four books was Pheroras, who, perceiving that the king's inclinations changed on a sudden, and that Archelaus's and that he had no honorable method of preserving himself, he procured his safety by his impudence. So he left Alexander and had recourse to Archelaus, who told him that he did not see how he could get him excused, now that he was directly caught in so many crimes, whereby it was evidently demonstrated that he had plotted against the king, and had been the cause of those misfortunes which the young man was now under, unless he could moreover leave off his cunning knavery, and his denials of what he was charged withal, and confess the charge, and implore pardon of his brother, who still had a kindness for him, but that, if he would do so, he would afford him all the assistance he was able. With this advice, Pheroras complied, and, putting himself into such a habit as might most move compassion, he came with black cloth upon his body, and tears in his eyes, and threw himself down at Herod's pardon for what he had done, 
and confessed that he had acted very wickedly, and was guilty of everything that he had been accused of, and lamented that disorder of his mind and distraction which his love to a woman, he said, had brought him to. So, when Archelaus had brought Pheroras to accuse and bear witness against himself, he then made an excuse for him, and mitigated Herod's anger towards him, and this by using certain domestical examples, for that when he had suffered much greater mischief from a brother of his own, he preferred the obligations of nature before the passion of revenge, because it is in kingdoms, as it is in gross bodies, where some member or other is ever swelled by the body's weight, in which case it is not proper to cut off such member, but to heal it by a gentle method of cure. Upon Archelaus saying this, and much more to the same purpose, Herod's displeasure against Pheroras was mollified. Herod's displeasure against Pheroras was mollified. Yet he did persevere in his own indignation against Alexander, and said that he would have his daughter divorced and taken away from him, and this till he had brought Herod to that pass, that, contrary to his former behavior to him, he petitioned Archelaus for the young man, and that he would let his daughter continued espoused to him. But Archelaus made him strongly believe that he would permit her to be married to any one else, but not to Alexander, because he looked upon it as a very valuable advantage, that the revelation they had contracted by that affinity, and the privileges that went along with it, might be preserved. And when the king said that his son would take it for a great favor to him, if he would not dissolve that marriage, especially since they had already children between the young man and her, and since that wife of his was so well beloved by him, and that as while she remains his wife she would be a great to him, and keep him from offending, as he had formerly done, so if she should be once torn away from him, she would be the cause of his falling into despair, because such young man's attempts are best mollified when they are diverted from them by settling their affections at home. So Archelaus complied with what Herod desired, but not without difficulty, and was both himself reconciled to the young man, and reconciled his father to him also. However, he said he must, by all means, be sent to Rome to discourse with Caesar, because he had already written a full account to him of this whole matter. Thus a period was put to Archelaus's stratagem, whereby he delivered his son-in-law out of the dangers he was in. But when these reconciliations were over, they spent their time in feastings and agreeable entertainments. And when Archelaus was going away, Herod made him a present of seventy talents, with a golden throne set with precious, set with precious stones, and some eunuchs, and a concubine who was called Panicus. He also paid due honors to every one of his friends according to their dignity. In like manner did all the king's kindred, by his command, make glorious presents to Archelaus. And, as he was conducted on his way by Herod and his nobility, as far as Antioch. Chapter 26 How Eurycles calumnated the sons of Mariamne, and how Euratus of Cost's apology for them had no effect. Now, a little time afterward, there came into Judea a man that was much superior to Archelaus's stratagems, who did not only overturn that reconciliation that had been so wisely made with Alexander, but proved the occasion of his ruin. He was a Lacedaemonian, and his name was Eurycles. Footnote. This vile, f vile fellow, Eurycles the Lacedaemonian, seems to have been the same who is mentioned by Plutarch, as twenty-five years before, a companion to Mark Antony, and as living with Herod, whence he might easily insinuate himself into the acquaintance of Herod's sons, Antipater and Alexander, as Usher, Hudson, and Spanheim justly suppose. The reason why his being a Spartan rendered him acceptable to the Jews, as we here see he was, is visible from the public records of the Jews and Spartans, owning those Spartans to be the kin to the Jews, and deriving from their common ancestor Abraham, the first patriarch of the Jewish nation. End footnote. He was so corrupt a man, that out of the desire of getting money, he chose to live under a king, for Greece could not suffice his luxury. He presented Herod with splendid gifts, as a bait, which he laid in order to compass his ends, and quickly received them back again manifold, 
yet did he esteem bare gifts as nothing, unless he imbrued the kingdom in blood by his purchases. Accordingly he imposed upon the king by flattering him, and by talking subtly to him, and also by the lying inconiums which he made upon him. For he soon perceived Herod's blind side, as he said and did everything that might please him, and thereby became one of his most intimate friends. For both the king and all that there were about him had a great regard for this Spartan, on account of his country. Now, as soon as this fellow perceived the rotten parts of the family, and what quarrels the brothers had with one another, and in what disposition the father was towards each of them, he chose to take his lodgings at first in the house of Antipater, but deluded Alexander but with a pretense of friendship to him, and falsely claimed to be an old acquaintance of Archelaus, for which reason he trade Alexander. He also soon recommended himself to his brother Aristobulus, and when he had thus made trial of these several persons, he imposed upon one of them by one method, and upon another by another. But he was principally hired by Antipater, and so betrayed Alexander, and this by reproaching Antipater, because, while he was the eldest son, he overlooked the intrigues of those who stood in the way of his expectations. And by reproaching Alexander, because he was born of a queen, and was married to a king's daughter, permitted one that was born of a mean woman to lay claim to the succession, and this when he had Archelaus to support him in the most complete manner. Nor was his advice thought to be other than faithful by the young man, because of the pretended friendship with Archelaus, on which young man, because of the pretended friendship with Archelaus, on which account it was that Alexander lamented to him Antipater's behavior in regard to himself, and this without concealing anything from him, and how it was no wonder if Herod, after he had killed their mother, should deprive them of her kingdom. Upon this, Eurycles pretended to commiserate his condition, and to grieve with him. He also, by a bait that he had laid for him, procured Aristobulus to say the same things. Thus did he inveigle between the two brothers to make complaints of their father, and then went to Antipater, and carried these grand secrets to him. He also added a fiction of his own, as if his brothers had laid a plot against him, and were almost ready to come upon him with their drawn swords. For this intelligence he received a great sum of money, and on that account he commended Antipater before his father, and at length undertook to their graves, and accused them before their father. So he came to Herod, and told him that he would save his life, as a requital for the favors he had received from him, and he would preserve his light of life by way of retribution for his kind entertainment. For that sword had long been wetted, and Alexander's right hand had long stretched out against him, but that he had laid impediments in his way, prevented his speed, and that, by pretending to assist him in his design, how Alexander said that Herod was not contented to reign in a kingdom that belonged to others, and to make dilapidations in their mother's government after he had killed her. And besides all this, that he had introduced a spurious successor, and proposed to give the kingdom of their ancestors to that pestilent fellow Antipater, and that he would now appease the ghosts of Hyrcanus and Mariamne, by taking vengeance on him, Canus and Mariamne, by taking vengeance on him, for that it was not fit for him to take succession to the government from such a father without bloodshed, that many things happen every day to provoke him to do so, insomuch that he can say nothing at all, but it affords occasion for calumny against him, for that, if any mention be made of nobility of birth, even in other cases, he is abused unjustly, while his father would say that nobody, to be sure, is of noble birth but Alexander, and that his father was inglorious for want of such nobility. If there be at any time hunting, he says nothing, he gives offense, and if he commands anybody, they take it in way of jest. They also find their father unmercifully severe, and they have no natural affection for any of them but for Antipater, on which accounts, if this plot does not take, he is very willing to die, but that, in case he hath sufficient opportunities for saving himself. In the first place he hath Archelaus, his father-in-law, to whom he can easily fly, and in the next place he hath Caesar, 
who had never known Herod's character to this day, for that he shall not appear then before him with that dread he used to do when his father was there to terrify him, and that he will not then produce the accusations that concerned himself alone, but would in the first place openly insist on the calamities of their nation, and how they are taxed to death, and in what ways of luxury and wicked practices that wealth is spent which was gotten by bloodshed. What sort of persons they are, they get our riches, and to whom those cities belong, upon whom he bestows his favors, that he would have inquiry made what became of his grandfather, Hyrcanus, and of his mother, Mariamne, and would openly proclaim the gross wickedness that was in the kingdom, on which accounts he should not be deemed a parent. When Eurycles had made this portentous speech, he greatly commended Antipater, as the only child that had an affection for his father, and on that account was an impediment to the other's plot against him. Hereupon the king, who had hardly repressed his anger upon the former accusations, was exasperated to an incurable degree, at which time Antipater took another occasion to send in other persons to his father, to accuse his brethren, and to tell him that they had privately discoursed with Jucundus and Tyrannus, who had been masters of the horse to the king, but for some offenses had been put out of that honorable employment. Herod was in a very great rage at these informations, and presently ordered those men to be tortured, yet did not they confess anything of what the king had been informed. But a certain letter was produced, as written by Alexander to the governor of a castle, to desire him to receive him and Aristobulus into the castle, when he had killed his father, and to give them weapons, and what other assistance he could, upon that occasion. Alexander said that this letter was a forgery of Diophantus. This Diophantus was the king's secretary, a bold man, and cunning in counterfeiting any one's hand, and after he had counterfeited a great number, he was at last put to death for it. Herod did also order the governor of the castle to be tortured, but got nothing out of him of what the accusation suggested. However, although Herod found the proofs too weak, he gave order to keep his sons kept in custody, for till now they had been at liberty. He also called that pest of his family, and forger of all this vile accusation, Eurycles, his savior and benefactor, and gave him a reward of fifty talents, upon which he prevented any accurate accounts that could come of what he had done, by into Cappadocia, and there he got money of Archelaus, having the impudence to pretend that he had reconciled Herod to Alexander. He thence passed over into Greece, and used what he had thus wickedly gotten to the like wicked purposes. Accordingly, he was twice accused before Caesar, that he had filled Achaea with sedition, and had plundered its cities, and so he was sent into banishment. And thus he was punished for that wicked actions he had been guilty of about Aristobulus and Alexander. But it will be worth while to put Euratus of Cos in opposition to this Spartan, for, as he was one of Alexander's most intimate friends, and came to him in his travels at the same time that Eurycles came, so that the king put the question to him, whether those things of which Alexander was accused were true. He assured him upon oath that he had never heard any such things from the young men. Nor did this testimony avail nothing for the clearing of those miserable creatures. For Herod was only disposed and most ready to hearken to what made against them, and every one was most agreeable to him that would believe they were guilty, and showed their indignation at them. End of Book 1 Chapters 25 and 26